Hope so. And we're live. It is Wednesday, August 11th, 5.04 p.m. Eastern Time. That chair did hold Tom Nichols. It is not a lie that Tom Nichols is here. <laughs> there he is. He went in search of Carla at my yeah, request. She's, and she always the, bugs me, and now she's not here. She'll show up. She'll like. She'll sense that I'm here, and she'll need to show up. So yes, um, it is. Uh, it is another episode of Where's the Lie? And we're not allowed to have fun anymore, but we are allowed to have Tom Nichols join us again. So and Tom, so Tom, yeah. have you seen any of the previous episodes of of Where's the Lie? No, I have not. So uh, that's that may be good because it it gives you. It, it's you won't be overly influenced by uh, uh, previous guests, but we've had Jonathan Rausch on telling a, a fabulous story about how he uh, uh, decided to uh, go to uh, Nevada for the Atlantic to hire a prostitute legally to see if uh, uh, he could lose his virginity to a woman, which yeah. he'd never done. Um, so. And that turned out to be false. Um, uh, (laughs) We've had uh, Dwayne Betts on telling the story of uh, uh, being a recently released convict on uh, Martha's Martha's Vineyard at an event with Martha's Vineyard High Society and ending up cutting somebody's hair in the back, uh, uh, Bobby Brown's father's hair in the bathroom. Um, That turned out to be true. (laughs) <laughs> um, and we had a uh, uh, classical historian Sarah Bond on to tell sex stories about Julius Caesar, which turns out to be uh, true it's if true you believe Suetonius. Yeah. yeah, I was going to say <laughs> um, the greatest gossip in all of classical <laughs> history. But yeah, right, exactly as true as you trust the sources. So uh, you're, I, I guess that you're the fourth guest, and. The way this works is you tell a story, uh, we grill you on on it, we put up to the audience who can change their vote at any time, is Tom lying? Um, and they can change their vote so you can see what they say and adjust the story as need be to persuade more of them. Um, and um, uh, then we grill you a little bit about the story and then we bring on a couple audience members to grill you about the story and then we all deliver our verdicts and then you do the big reveal okay so uh as they say in congress the gentleman should take such time as he may require uh well uh speaking of congress it is actually a story about congress and how um stupid and clueless i was once as a young man um i started working in the senate at 29 And for all of my pretense of sophistication, I really didn't know that much about, I I was not wise in the ways of Washington. And I started working for John Hines as a Republican. And um, I got to, I had floor privileges, which was very cool. Uh, That that is, you know, for those of you that never worked in Congress, that lets you just walk in and out of the cloakroom and onto the floor of the Senate at will, um, at a cool little badge that I have flying around here somewhere. Um, But uh, I committed like the most brainless faux pas, which is that in the cloakroom, uh, my boss, uh, we had been advocating for a particular piece of the defense authorization bill that related to the Philadelphia Naval Yard. And um, he was having a kind of rough and tumble with his minority leader at the time, Senator Bob Dole. And I was there and I was part of the meeting. Checks and, out, checks out. Bob Dole was a Senate minority leader. <laughs> uh, you know, and uh, we're in the cloakroom and, you know, Bob Dole's talking about Bob Dole and John Hines is saying, I need this thing in and, you know, you got to take it forward. and. Um, and I'm standing there, you know, and they're throwing me a question now and then. And finally, they uh, they get to, and I, you know, youthful exuberance, they get to an agreement, finally. And um, uh, Heinz, you know, s- claps, get, kind of puts his hand, thanks, Bob. And I said, thanks, Senator. And I went for a high five. 
to Bob Dole, who, of course, he doesn't cannot, have the use of one arm. Does not have the use of his hand. And I got this cold stare from these two senators. And I, and I was like, for a minute, about to say, don't leave me hanging. And then uh, from... <gasps> And then from from then on, every time I was on the floor, Dole looked at me, pointed his pen, like to say, hey, "I remember you, asshole." And uh, so that was my um, that was my my introduction to uh, you know maybe not being too overly familiar with a senator who doesn't have the use of his arm and uh, isn't gonna you know uh, give you the give you the, the the love okay so i i, I want to ask as a preliminary matter why didn't dole just give you the high five with the other hand because i was on that side of him and also bob dole does not do that bob dole not doesn't do that kind of thing and i was standing he my bo- i was to my boss's right and he came i think Heinz was on my right and i was standing there and I kind of did that. And of course, you know, my, my boss just kind of looked at me like, I should just fire you right now. And, um, you know, just it was this look of complete contempt. And every now and then, from then on, I walk out on the floor and, you know, he'd catch me out of course and I'd go, and, and, you know, and I, it was a long year of that. And how, um, was that the worst mistake you made as a Senate staffer? Like just at a, sort of social interpersonal dealing with senators level i'm try. uh it, it certainly is the worst <clears throat> mistake i ever made with a member of the senate yes not the worst mistake i made in my personal life where other staff were concerned but we're not talking about those today um i want to know uh so i'm gonna uh do you which arm was it I believe I was standing to Heinz's left, which means I was on uh, Dole's right. But we're talking 30 years ago. I'm trying to remember because the cloakroom, you came in and they were kind of face to face. And I think I was on the left of Heinz. But it, it, did, it kind of didn't matter because there was no way Bob Dole was going to do something that casual with some idiot young staffer. Um, but, you know, when I looked down and realized, you know, that I'm, um, you know, getting got this thing going on and I was like, oh my God, now I have to ritually disembowel myself as an offering to the Senate gods. So just a reminder to members of the Greek chorus here, Googling facts in the story is cheating. Uh, We all have the universe of human knowledge at our fingertips. We (laughs) do not use it uh, in this game. Or in general, in life, often some of us don't bother. <laughs> but uh, so, um, what what were you th- what were you thinking? Why why did you feel a high five? I was thinking I was the coolest kid. I was thinking I was the coolest twenty something in America who had just been part of brokering a deal to save a big employer in the state that my boss was from. And that I was one of the boys, that I was in the cloakroom. I was one of the club. I could do anything I wanted. You know? So do you think Do you think if we called Bob Dole, I mean, he's still around. Um, if we called him and said, hey, you know, do you remember Tom Nichols? He'd say, yeah, I watch that asshole on MSNBC all the Bob time. Bob Dole watched that he, asshole. He, he's, the one, he's the one. <laughs> He's the one who tried to high five me when he was 29, or do you think it has no, he has no a, memory of it at all? I was an insignificant bug to be squashed with a look of heat ray vision and, to, and a source of mild amusement for a few months after that. There was no way that Bob Dole, Bob Dole doesn't remember insignificant staffers that commit completely stupid things because that's how Bob Dole is. I mean, I was... There's n- there's absolutely not a chance that Bob Dole would ever remember that. Yes, but he when you, when you commit a a year. with powerful people, you remember it. They don't. But he remembered it for a while when he saw well, you. Sure, because I was working there every day. I was going in and out of the the, the um, cloakroom every day. All right. 
Kate, do you have more questions on this, Henry. or should we bring in audience questioners? Okay. So I think we bring should bring in, in John Bordeaux yes. uh, to celebrate his return. Yes, I agree. I'm going to bring in John and Genevieve. Um, so... Uh, so there's nothing at all implausible about this story. No. Um, I, I think I, anyone who knows me would, would I tell just you typed that. in Bob Dole into the uh, into the search function. No, you're I not allowed have, to search I know, Bob I'm not Dole. Allowed to search Bob it's Dole. against the rules. I know. I, I mean, I, I but have it's this. It's not the kind of thing that would show up in a Google search because it's like, you know, a, a complete moment of you know, that there's no Google category for stupid staffers in 1990. No, but there is a Google category for like, which side is Bob Dole's injury on? Mm -hmm. And some people in the Greek chorus were checking out your, your, the geography of your, uh, of your story by, by searching, you know, which arm. Uh, I'll just claim, I'll just claim a faulty memory be here because I, I can't remember which side, they were face to face, and I can't remember if I was on, I want to say that I was on Heinz's left, and I think du Dole's, actually it's his left hand, but he just, he doesn't raise his arms. I mean, he was an injured, it, it'd be like trying to like, do a double fiver with John McCain or something, which that would have been a bullshit story to, you know, that because everybody knows McCain can't raise his arms. But it was the same thing with Dole. You can't it just had a bad hand and I wasn't even, you, let's put it this way. When it comes to Bob Dole, you don't do a lot with your hands. I, hmm, you bring it, raise an interesting point. John Bordeaux, what are you thinking? Can you can you hear me on this? I'm sorry, the thing ran long camera. Yeah, yes. Great. Um, I'm sorry, Tom. How you doing, my friend? Down 27. You got pounds, that thanks. side yeah. angle on your face too. It's good. Yeah, yeah. that's it's not good. a that's not a good shot. I apologize. I'll do this. No, because you spent a year on the Senate floor of Bob Dole, and you can't remember which arm was out. I I'm telling you, it's like hysterical blindness. I, I didn't look down. I I was standing there, and I suddenly realized. He's not, this is, this is the most inappropriate thing I've ever done and I need to throw up. But the, but the rest of the time on the Senate floor, he pointed the pen at you and you still can't remember which arm it was. Mm -mm. To this day, I've seen him on TV a million times and I can't remember which arm it is. I just, you, you have to understand, it flood, this floods me with like <laughs> embarrassed anxiety. So I just My, want to say, yeah. back in 1996, uh, Jack Schaefer, back when Slate was, you know, young and good, Jack Schaefer uh, did a wonderful article about Bob Dole's war injury that... Uh, you can't read this right now. No, no, no. It, it has nothing to do really? with this point. Uh, it, it merely um, uh, recounted that Bob Dole actually talks about his war injury constantly, always by way of saying, I don't talk about my injury. Um, and it was, it's a wonderful article about how to A, capitalize on a war injury and B, get credit for being bashful about it. Um, and all these years later, it is a wonderful uh, uh, account of po the way politicians uh, behave. Uh, and it's great. Do not read this article. There are facts in this article that have been up for discussion. Ben, I, I, read it later. <laughs> Gen Genevieve, you have a question. I do. How often was it brought up amongst the other staffers that you worked with that this happened? Uh, Heinz tore me a new one and left it at that. So no I one that more bad. than once. Pardon? So John? No, he was no the kind of guy to blow up it once is. and then let it go. But every now and then, uh, you know, we'd be like in the cloakroom and Dole would walk by and Heinz would give me this kind of side eye and I'd be like, it was like, it was like the specter of Christmas, you know, the ghost of Christmas past going by. And I'd be like, um, th there's a f only a couple of times that Heinz ever just really tore me a new one. And that was that one. And another time was when I pulled him out of a meeting and I didn't have the facts he wanted, and he literally tore me apart on the floor of the Senate, um, which you know is a day that will live in infamy. Sounds because like it was a like toxic Constance. workplace. It's, it's the Senate. It could have been worse. He didn't have a king. 
How many people were in the cloakroom? Pardon? How many people were in the cloakroom at the time of this uh, alleged event? If, if you this know the cloakroom, right, it's an L-shaped thing. So there's like a little in, and then it kind of goes to the right, and then you can go out onto the floor. So if I remember, the, the person I was remember in the cloakroom sitting there was Jesse Helms, because he used to do his kind of timeout. But we were in the part that was just before the exit back to the lobby. So it was just, it was the three of us. I think Helms was around in his usual spot, kind of right outside the door of, of the cloakroom. But I don't, that, I, I, yeah, you know, go, sorry. Your turn. I'm trying to think. I want to ask a question about Bob Dole's behavior, but you kind of answered it already. But for the, like, how often, how often have you told this story to people? Uh, not often, um, but on, on, on a case, I certainly don't, you know, it's not like something you tell your students to say, hey, here's how I enhance my credibility by telling you what a complete moron I was at 29. Because I, I, no. I just want to say, I, like one, the one thing that makes me skeptical of this story is it honestly doesn't sound that bad. I mean, I did way worse stuff than yeah, this I agree. professionally. Well, man, your and, tolerance for humiliation is a lot higher than mine. I mean, I, I did stuff when I was like 26, 27, professionally that people still make fun of me about um and um like well show. i'm sure you know john hines died <laughs> later the next year and yeah but i i doubt, like i doubt when the plane was going like, down he was like i really wish i'd fired that asshole well, who tried to high five <laughs> you well, the know thing, the thing about it is you know that uh it's you're not going to keep bringing up that the minority leaner, that your aide was the guy who completely shit the bed in front of the minority leaner. I mean, it might have been, we used to make fun of Arlen Specter a lot um, because- Who did at, it? At, at, as who well you that, should. Right? And, and we actually had to put a stop to that. And we had guys who got in trouble. And one of our guys, um, we actually pranked him by calling him uh, with somebody who did a dead on Arlen impression. So that, but that, but, Dole and his injury, that that one was off limits. That one, the boss just chewed me out and like was like, you know, you have a lot to learn, young Padwan. And oh, by the way, that, I mean, the thing I guess is that it was inappropriate, even if Dole, even if Dole had been perfectly healthy, it's just a stupid kid thing to do. And uh, after that, I started, you know, making sure my shoes were shined and my tie was a little straighter and that, you know, like I was in, among grownups now and I had to kind of act like it. John Bordeaux, How you often get your did last you question. This is your Aren't last you? one. This is me? Yeah. How often Why? did you high five Senator Hines? Never. Never. That was. So this was I, an impulsive oh, thing. You'd never high five to Senator before, but you went straight. No, I never, like, this started, was, this was started with the majority deal, leader. Right? I, I mean, you know, I, like Minority. three months later, I, 30 months earlier, I'd been teaching, you know, I was an assistant professor at Dartmouth, and all of a sudden, like, these two personal friends of President Bush are like, you know, backslapping over a deal to save a, a naval yard in Philadelphia. And I felt like I had really nothing to do with it, of course. I was there, I should have understood I was there to be a scribe, um, you know, but I somehow thought I was part of the gang and I just thought I was like in like like Flint, you know, and learned very quickly that i mean my my colleagues found out about other stuff and pranked me but this one this was was a little on the touchy side and it just it was an ass chewing and then forgotten or okay, your last or question color. genevieve hmm were you allowed to come to meetings for the like the future after that for like a little while or were you kind of put in like a timeout after the there were, no because there was no try i was personal staff i wasn't committee staff so i had to go with them everywhere you know and i mean there was one time we were walking from russell uh and this was as we were heading toward the vault where they were getting because the gulf war the other thing is i had to go with the boss all the time because the gulf war first gulf war broke out and I think he, he kind of growled something like, and, and we're gonna, you know, we're gonna keep the 
cheerleading to a minimum or something like that. We're going to be, you know, we're going to keep it professional or something like that. And I was like, uh, just, uh, you know. Okay, so GDF and JBX, hang hang tight for a second. Okay. okay. The uh, we're going to get the final verdict here. Ben, do you have any more questions? I'm good. I know what I think. Um, I want to say that the poll right now, oh, the poll's changing, are 42 votes that you're telling the truth, 53.8%, and 46.2% think that you're lying. Um, it has occurred to me that boring stories would be easier to lie about. And, like, you know, you could be like, yesterday I went to the grocery store. No, I didn't actually go to the grocery store. It was the oh dry God. cleaners, fuckers. <laughs> yes, exactly. But that's another key thing. I have been thinking a lot about how to lie in this game. If I was to tell my own story, because I have these crazy stories, which are fun stories, but they're true. And like everyone knows how insane I am on this show, so everyone would just believe it. So I've been trying to think about like how I would possibly lie. And the only way that I think to possibly lie would be to swap out like large details of things that like happened, but like changed the person. And you mentioned John McCain and his inability to high five, only a low fiver. And so I think that this happened, but it happened with John McCain. That is my guess. Whoa, that's a hot take. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to go with this story isn't outrageous enough to be a lie. Um, I think this story is true. Um, it's exactly the kind of youthful, uh, professional faux pas that would haunt somebody for the rest of his life, but that actually doesn't make that much of an impression on other people. Because I listened to this story and I was like, I mean, I'll, I'll, when we're done, I'll tell you a professional faux pas of mine uh, from around the same age that I think is way worse than this. Um, uh, but like, this doesn't sound that bad to me. And so I think if you were making up a professional faux pas, there would be something like, like maybe you grabbed Dole's arm and shook it uh, vigorously <laughs> or something. Um, there would be like physical violence done to Bob Dole. Um, uh, so I'm going to go with true. And I just want to say, Tom, it's okay. We forgive you for this. It it's, wasn't that bad. Will you forgive me for lying my ass off and sucking you all in on this story? Uh, if that's what it turns out to be, you will have fooled me. Genevieve, John, what are your what are your thoughts? I, um, well, I, I just ratted. I didn't realize they were still. I just ratted myself out. I'm totally making this up. Oh, that's excellent. Well done. Totally. <laughs> you fooled the audience. You fooled. <laughs> you, Kate is. got it. Kate's fantasy about it was wrong. I got it wrong. Genevieve and John, what were you going to say? I was going to say that it wasn't true. Truly was going to say that because he kept rubbing his nose. Aha. Uh -huh. Did I? John, was John I what, did, what, what, what were you going to say? Is it truly made up? You made this up? Yes, totally. totally. See, okay, I was, I was dealing with what Paula said in the chat. I was thought of it also that he had heard about someone doing something similar, possibly no. King. Uh, but I, I definitely thought he was lying because you know which arm Bob Dole I do I honest to God don't know. If oh. you ask me this right now, I don't remember which arm it's it was. The right I saw arm. Him right it's the right arm. It's the right arm. He carried the pen for a reason. Okay. All right. So we have everybody who <laughs> Holy actually announced everybody oh who actually announced uh beforehand uh, was fooled. Uh, and miraculously, everybody who got to reserve judgment uh got it right. Um oh, damn. Here's the thing. Was, <laughs> I do comment, I decided, sorry, that was my based vote. On, there was a moment that the conversation alone in the cloakroom happened. And um, my it was about Israeli settlements, and my boss was uh, giving him shit, giving Dole shit about some anti-Israel, as you know, that always played well in Kansas. And um, my boss was 
reeling off some talking points that I had briefed for him the way all politicians do. And Dole, I was kind of standing to Dole's side, you know, over like they were talking like this. And Dole realized where that, you know, my boss had gotten all this ammo about Dole's, it was like a Dole bird bill or something. And he kind of did this. He kind of looked over at me and went, you know, like, I know it was you, you little bastard. And I thought, now what would make this, what would make this a story worth lying about? Uh, you know, that, that I might, the people who know me would say I might have, cause I, I am inappropriately enthusiastic, especially as a young guy. I don't have a lot of personal reserve. And I thought, what if I tried to high five Bob Dole? Uh, wouldn't that have been, wouldn't that have just been the balls, you know? Um, but of course I didn't. I was scared shitless most of the time I was standing there. I wouldn't have even thought to look at the man. You know, he gave me that look and I was like, I felt like, uh, you know, like my ability to father children had vanished, uh, you know, with that side eye he gave me. So I said, okay, um, you know, unverifiable, but close enough. As anyone who's ever worked with the intelligence community will tell you, right? How, what's the mark of a good lie? It's close enough to the truth that even you think it happened. Um, well, and, and that's actually why, uh, why you got me with it, because it's, it wasn't so bad that like, um, I look at, excuse like me, the, look at all these people changing their votes. You yeah, yeah no, no, that's I that's low you. people. You you screwed the pooch. I win. Forget about it. Yeah, right. I can't um, believe you see. So and we and even if you change your vote now, people, we still you know have the record of where the votes were. And by the way, I can see and Kate can see how you voted, no matter when you change your vote. So like we have the data. You know, big data follows you. And we've got, you know, you know, you you think you're gonna, uh, <laughs> okay. you think you're gonna fool us, but we're gonna uh, we're gonna publish everything. Oh, well, it was the body language, and I could spot this. I mean, remember, I can't. I'm not in the room with you, so you know, to maintain body contact or eye contact, I have to keep looking at the camera, uh, and then I can't see you guys because I have to look at you guys to judge how well I'm selling this bullshit. Uh, so it's a you little a harder to lie on how... camera. Nice so, job. So thank I you very had... much. Well, I'm going to tell a true. Well, this is a true story. I was going to tell you no, a story you to make you feel tell, better. You can't tell a true story and announce that it's true. Well, you, I'm not the one who's. Where's the lying? That's not. I'm. Um, I was going to try to make you feel better, Tom, and now I resent you, so I'm not going to try to do it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I will. T I will tell you guys a story of of my professional faux pas as a twenty something, and you guys will have to decide if it's true or not. Um, so in the 1996 uh, presidential campaign, people forget about this now, but there was a scandal about foreign money in the 1996 campaign. And it was actually about Chinese money. Uh, I remember that. And it was about uh, uh, people carrying large amounts of money and donating it to the Clinton campaign or the Democratic Party and getting access to the White House as a result, staying in the Lincoln bedroom, people like Charlie Tree um, and uh, uh, some other folks uh, whose names I don't remember. And um, I was a young reporter at the time in 1996-97 for Legal Times, and I became fascinated by this uh, character named uh, Nora Lum, who was a Hawaii-based, uh, 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 oddly connected financier of democratic causes, who had started a, um, she was married to a man named Eugene Lum, and she had started a company in Oklahoma with the son of the Commerce Secretary, Michael Brown. Uh, this was Ron Brown's son, and they were all running a company together called Dynamic Energy Resources. And I discovered the company Dynamic Energy Resources as a young reporter, just doing searches of FEC data. Um, and um, this launched a, I don't know, six-month, eight-month, ten-month, year-long 
investigative flurry on my part to try to figure out what was going on with dynamic energy resources and the LUMS. Uh, and this took me into the depths of Hawaii politics. All of this, by the way, is true. And, has, and I eventually did uh, publish a long story about yeah. this in, in Legal Times. And actually, the person who was competing with me to break this story was a reporter at the Associated Press named John Solomon, who has since gone on to fame, infamy, and fortune as a right-wing conspiracy theorist about the FBI, and he's a sort of pro-Trump conspiracy theorist journalist. But um, so all of this was uh, going on in the background. And you know, when you're doing investigative reporting, you get a little bit obsessive and you get a little conspiratorial. And the Lums were kind of scary people. And and uh, one night I am and I was you know definitely getting in the weeds of crazed conspiracy theories theorizing. Um, and one night at my house, the doorbell rings, and it is somebody purporting to deliver Chinese food. But it's hundreds and hundreds of dollars of Chinese food. And Tammy and I had not ordered any Chinese food. Um, and But the person had our name and was like at the door um, and wanted to deliver this Chinese food and wanted to be paid for it. And uh, this, this we, is like Bob Cratchit getting the Christmas goose. He, it's anonymous. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And we were we were really weirded out by it. Um, and we didn't let him in and we didn't pay him. And we stiffed the Chinese restaurant of probably two hundred dollars. Um, but we we hadn't ordered it. Um, and I was convinced that this was the lum sending me a message. Um, and I went in to my office the next day, because like it's not every day that hundreds of dollars of Chinese food shows up at your apartment um, with your uh, name on it. And, um, and I went in the next day and I pulled my editors and told them what had happened and told them I thought this was uh, um, uh, you know, the lum sending me a message. And they looked at me like I was insane and said, you know, like, why, if they wanted to send you a message, wouldn't they leave like a dead fish in, in you know, a, a, a wrapper? Um, and the other, the other element of this was that Tammy had an alternate explanation. So it turns out when hundreds of dollars of unordered Chinese food show up at your house, you, everybody reads their own situation into it as the explanation. And Tammy, who was- Is it based on fortune cookies? No, Tammy's explanation was that um, there was a kid in her, uh, 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 the class that she was TAing that she had just busted for plagiarizing something. Uh. And she was convinced that it was, uh, that it was him um, and she'd gotten him in, in trouble, and then the Chinese food had showed up. And I was convinced it was the Lums. Um, and I go in, and my editors um, were, and one of them, Tom Watson, uh, still razzes me about this. Like, you know, uh, you know, and we could get Tom Watson on the show, and he would, now you can't call Tom Watson, because that would be cheating for purposes of this. Uh, but Tom, like, still, whenever the subject of the 2000, uh, the 1996 campaign finance scandal comes up, he's always like, and, and then they bought a bunch of Chinese food for you, Ben. Um, and so I think I lost, like, 10 years of credibility with my editors <laughs> that day. You um, know, one, way that, one way that you should have known I was lying, and, and this goes to your prank point, the Senate is the coolest working environment there is because it's all young, hard charging assholes. And there's <laughs> no way. We that have different I, that definitions that of cool workplaces. <laughs> well, cool, cool. Not cool. cool. Oh, cruel. Okay, yes. Okay, now that's a cruel workplace. And uh, there is just no way that this that story no wouldn't have gotten out. And I wouldn't have been tortured about it 
relentless. The idea when I, I mean, I knew I was on a limb. I said, no, the senator and I kept it quiet, and he just shooting me out, and we let it go. Absolutely not. I mean, um, you know, the senators were more than happy to be part part of the pranks around that building. So, so uh, I have almost that, an exact replica of your story, but in the Second Circuit. So this is why this kind of resonated with me. Um, so I was clerking and my judge was super casual. Like, first of all, our chambers were in Geneseo, so like way upstate. And then, um, and so we're like six hours from New York and we'd come down to New York for sittings. And sometimes the judges take their clerks out with another clerk from the panel um, or something. And you guys all go out to like, Chinese food, actually, usually, uh, because it's not far from Chinatown, that courthouse. And we were doing this with an, un, I will, will go unnamed, uh, other judge that had been on this panel. And there had been a Title Seven um, workplace complaint, like in which this woman had had been, I just had been really, really harassed by her colleagues in a police um, precinct. And there was just like a whole thing. Um, and it had been an appeal and had been happening for a long time. And I had been, I had briefed the whole case for my judge and was really right in on it. And the, one of the judges that was, um, one of the judges that was uh, on the, that we were out to lunch with had voted against what I thought they were going to vote, like in the panel. And we had like been briefed of what the panels had all come back on and what they had done in like pre-conference. And I was like shocked. Like I was kind of like, I cannot believe that they did that. This is like against all of their other kind of things that they've written or whatever. And so the thing that you also have to know is that my parents are both judges. I used to have to sit in the jury box when I was like homesick from work. And like my mom would take me into court and like stick me in the jury box while there was like a civil trial or something. And there are no other jury, jur like, and make me like read or like do something else. But like, this is like, I just grew up in courthouses and don't have a, like a, there, just, there isn't a whole lot of like austerity that I have in my mind around judges. Um, and so we're sitting at the big Chinese dinner table in like this restaurant. And I turn to the judge and I say, not my judge. And I turn to the judge and I say, I'm really surprised that you voted that way in the panel. And my judge is at the other end of the table and he just screams, hey, Kay inappropriate and that was it that was it that was all that happened i turned bright this red. is totally true it's completely true no this is a completely true story and i like just turned bright red and just was like wow i completely forgot like that i'm like these people are not like my parents and like that i can't like or that you know and oh god i was and my judge i could talk to like that because he was very casual i had a relationship with him um but this was another judge, and it was just like I just hadn't, I just like forgotten myself for a second. So I actually did. Like, you try to high five any of the judges? No, <laughs> <laughs> no. But I was like, I, I was. I mean, I still think about that. Like as I'm one of those thoughts that dances through your brain as you fall asleep at night, and you're like, oh god, and you just kind of shudder, and you're like, ugh, I was such an idiot. Um, so this but that wasn't that long ago. Thanks, Ben. Yeah. <laughs> How long ago were you clerking? It's like seven years. Yeah. 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 I mean, it wasn't. Yeah. So it was. Yeah. Yeah, but was those first seven years, years of your career are like, they're like the years from high school to after college. That's a long seven years. It's not like seven years between fifty-three and sixty. It's the seven years that are. See, Kate, I'm here for you. Yeah, I, thanks. I, thanks. I have only two professional <laughs> shiver, two professional shiver memories, but they are so <laughs> acute that I don't think I could tell the story. Um, yeah, but they're, I'm kind they're, of over this mostly because I don't even think the judge heard me, but my judge heard me, <laughs> and so that was all that mattered. And he still loves me, so I'm fine with it. But I did feel like an ass. I was like, really, yeah. Okay, we would be terrible people if we went an hour. Without with Tom asking. Nichols without talking about your book. Oh, yeah. You have a new book coming out, <gasps> and we are not going, because we've got, like, people on the line here. Wait, hold that up again. Yeah, hold it up again. Um, We're going to tweet this. So, guys, there's a book you should order. Um, 
And, you know, we've got 150 people watching live here and more on, on YouTube. So go order the book. Um, tell us about it, Tom. Yeah. Well, uh, it is um, my favorite pre-review so far is Publishers Weekly that called it a cranky manifesto that is unlikely to change minds. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, you should put that on the back. Where's the um, lie? Where's where, the lie? The lie? <laughs> you know, I should have with that. If you couldn't Google, I you should need have a t-shirt with that. Book out and one of the pre-reviews is a cranky manifesto unlikely to change minds. Get that um, as a tattoo. I think. And, uh, you know, but I, I mean, I already, I already said that on Twitter a while back and people said, this is the book we, we pay you for. This is what we expected was cranky manifestos. Um, I, you know, about after the death of expertise came up, by the way, the death of expertise has gone into its 14th foreign language as of today. It will be available in Armenian in case anybody needs that. <laughs> um, and uh, I, I held off on writing another book. I mean, I had, you know, with the book, landed well and so people say gotta write more get an agent to die i still don't have an agent i didn't do any of that stuff i just wanted to wait until i felt like there was something that i wanted to say and the the thing that had been nagging at me all through this is that every time i talked about the death of expertise or any of the stuff i wrote during 2017 2018 you know it was always this question of democracy is in trouble we can't go on this way how can we sustain a democracy like this and aren't we doomed? And then, and then I, so that was part of it. And I thought, oh, you know, are we doomed? Is this really, am I, as an American, am I really thinking these questions? But then I started to push back on some of the um, explanations. You know, it's only a couple of years ago that people still took seriously the idea that economic anxiety, you know, the economic anxiety argument, like the people are rioting and. Um, it's globalization and it's you heartless elites and it's income inequality and it's climate change. And I said, you know, I don't think I, I'm I, I not sure these are true. And I think like a good scholar, I should go out there and try and actually test some of this and try to explain. I mean, I think we all agreed at some point that democracy globally is in trouble. Poland, Turkey, Hungary, the United States. You know, a lot of uh, Thailand, you know, Italy, Philippines, um, the UK. I mean, you name it, right? You can almost every advanced democracy is running into some serious populist headwinds and kind of chicanery. And and, uh, and so I said, well, this is, you know, I've spent my life studying authoritarianism. Maybe I should think about studying democracy more. And um, I was really blocked on, this is the hardest book I ever wrote. I mean, I wrote a whole book on nuclear war that wasn't as hard to write as this because I kept stopping saying, can I really be reaching? I mean, I think essential to good scholarship is that you have to keep asking yourself, what is the hardest case that can be made against my argument, right? And you have to deal with that. You can't just write it and say, wave away the other arguments. And I kept saying, you know, am I am I right about this? Could could this be the case? And because the answer I came up with is that 35 to 40 years of narcissism fueled by affluence and peace and rising living standards has turned us into really bad citizens and maybe bad people. And and it's. I, I see somebody right away zinging me. Well, it's conservatives and social programs. Yes. So, okay. That's the political manifestation of it. But this narcissistic, um, you know, abandonment of the center where all politics became performative and voting was sort of boring, but reaming people out and having extreme positions was interesting. Um, I, I really think that this was the emanation of something that wasn't about politics. It's about our narcissistic, I don't, I don't want to use the word decadent because that sounds so Soviet, but there is a kind of narcissistic affluent decadence that has overtaken us all. Um, and I don't mean just the elites. I don't mean rich people. I mean, this extends, you know, all the way down to the people who are sen sitting there with a beer watching HGTV and saying, well, come on, I don't have granite countertops. Yeah. The government has failed me. Democracy so, sucks. Um, you know, we are our, our threshold uh, for where where we draw the line at democracy sucks 
has become so low that it's like if the Wi-Fi goes out, democracy has failed us. And what's really interesting about this is that I the, the book, I kind of kept holding off on this and trying to do more research and go kind of plowing through all the data and looking at polls and you know economic data. Um, but that, as, as we found, increasingly, both in the United States, Italy, the UK, I talk a lot about Italy in this book, the people that are most hostile to democracy are actually the middle class. It's a lumpen, it's a lumpen bourgeoisie. It's bored, mildly affluent real estate developers and sa real estate salesmen who want to go to the Capitol and burn, you know, lynch Mike Pence and then go home and brag about it on Instagram. Um, this is not, as I say in the book, these are not the, the barefoot people of Appalachia you know, trying to find clean water. These are not at the African-Americans of 1965 trying to be fully empowered citizens. These are not, you know, the gay and lesbian couples of the 1970s who couldn't get married. These are, I mean, it's really remarkable that the attack on democracy, and, and I say this in a comparative context because this is true in Turkey, it's true in Poland, it's true in Hungary. Hungary has almost no income. Any, on the Gini, the Gini scale, Hungary is, has practically no income inequality. Poland has a viciously nationalistic anti-Muslim movement. What's the punchline? There are no Muslims in no Poland. No Muslims. There aren't any Muslims in Poland. These are, this is the affluent board working and middle classes saying democracy just isn't interesting and it's not worthy of my importance. So I want to ask you an, a particularly American version of this problem. Uh, Newsweek today asked me to do a debate uh, on uh, a podcast debate on vaccine mandates, uh, which I agreed to do. And I found myself, I won't uh, mention her name, uh, pending the release of the um, uh, podcast, but I found myself debating a woman who uh, could not bring herself to say that the smallpox vaccination mandate was appropriate and did not really resist when I said, hey, if it were up to you, we would still have a certain amount of residual endemic smallpox in society. Um, where does that fit into this thesis? That this is, you know, that, that these are people who, there's some rejection the war on expertise plays into this, but there's some, I think, element of this kind of, and again, I don't love the word, uh, 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 you know, I, I don't love the sort of Soviet uh, vocabulary for it either, but there's some element of it that's, you know, a kind of really anti-communitarian, uh, laziness. I, yes. I don't. I, and yeah. and so, so just w walk me through. It's like somebody who gets on and says, "My rights, my rights, not to be vaccinated." There may be eight religious people or people with you know certain uh, 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 certain medical conditions. Therefore, uh, any effort to increase vaccinations through private or public sector mandates is, you know, an assault on our liberties. Uh, help me already, out. Where, 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 where does that rails. fit into your thesis? You're already off the rails by assuming the subject matter matters. That in it just in this case, it happens to be vaccinations. I think insofar as the subject matter is important, this is where this issue of affluence comes in. And, and high living standards. One of my students years ago, when I was doing, a, I was doing a lecture on um, biological weapons, and I pointed out that I'd been vaccinated for smallpox. And this kid comes up to me, and this is what I mean about kind of the adaptation to the world being as good as it is. This kid says to me, "Professor, why did they vaccinate you for smallpox? Nobody gets that." <laughs> Bingo. And I just waited for a moment to say. Why do you uh, think that anyway. is? Oh, I am, the, you know. I am that rare, rare person, our age, Tom, 
who was not vaccinated for smallpox. Well, did you know? I, I got it because I tra I, went, I had relatives in Greece, and to go to Southern Europe, you had to get vaccinated for smallpox. No, the I the, had a vaccine passport. Yeah, the reason I didn't get it is that I had a specific medical condition as ah, a baby okay. that exempted me from it. But, but you but know, the thing about people our age not, are uniformly vaccinated against smallpox because and, there was a mandate. The question, though, you're asking about why are they digging in on this? It, it is it's the narcissism problem. You're not the boss of me. You can't tell me what to do. I'm unique. I make my own decisions. I do my own research. I'm very everybody is Fredo from the Godfather. I'm smart. I can do things not like people say, you know, the idea that you could say, look, I, I don't you know, I need to take the polio vaccine or the small box, smallpox vaccine or a coat. I was reading a piece today by somebody. I didn't think it was a I'm not going to say who because I didn't think it was a great piece, but it was about, you know, the vaccine resistors are not bad people. They're just con and they, she quoted one of them saying, well, I'm getting the Pfizer, right? And it's like, do you know, I wrote a piece about this in the Atlantic uh, six months ago. I said, I said the same thing. Hey, my wife said we're going to get vaccinated. I said, hey, which one is it? And even I said this as though it could possibly matter and I would know the difference between them. Um, and but we have become so obsessed with our own self empowerment and the expression of our own preferences about everything that we that our na you know the the national battle cry is you're not the boss of me and we've become a nation of really we've really become a nation of toddlers. You know, well, now we're in Dan Dresner's category. Oh, um. but Dresner, right. I mean, in this, you know, we elect, think of it, tr Trump was the triumph of an electorate, of a slice of the electorate that is um, crude and narcissistic and childlike. Yeah. And the idea that we were once this very stoic, mature country now seems like the distant past to me. I mean, I look at people that are. You know, like I think about when I was a kid and people that were my father's age, and I thought of them as adults. And I look around now and I see guys, you know, in big shorts with their ball cap on backwards saying, you know, hey, I, you know, I, I need more information about this uh, Fizerna thing because I'm, I'm, a, I'm a fully involved citizen. You're not a fully involved citizen. You're an overgrown 13 year old. And, and we really lost something here by by this constant sense of narcissistic empowerment it doesn't occur to people to say i'm part of a community i have obligations you notice that all of this my my rights my rights my rights. nobody talks about their obligations you know what is it well i pay my taxes well you know there's a lot more and, and actually a lot of those people don't even do that uh you know or do it uh, uh, honestly um but i think you know in this sense and in the book in the book one one whole chapter is about um, those of us who, if you've if you ha studied the social sciences in college or grad school, you had to read a book called The Moral Economy of a Backwards Society or The Moral Basis of a Backward Society, and it was about a village in Italy in the 50s where nobody, everybody was about the family and the clan and nothing else. It's a classic work by a guy named Edward Banfield. And he talked about what happens when a society is all based on a complete lack of morality other than taking care of your own family. And that his argument was, if you look at areas that are consistently poor and impoverished and, you know, have trouble with making community projects work, it's because people say, my family, my kids, and fuck you. And that's it. And I think we've become, we have literally regressed backward toward being instead of a modern democratic superpower, we have regressed backward toward being a kind of impoverished Italian village from 1952. And people so, don't want to, I mean, I, I was, I'll admit, I was anxious about this. I've been, re, I was reluctant about this book coming out because a lot of people, it's going to piss a lot of people off to have to think of themselves that way. Um, you know, everybody's got an excuse. Everyone has an excuse. There's a, I talk in the book about you know, people say, well, you know, cost of living, for example. And yet people routinely take out seven year car loans into which they roll two and three other car loans that they've never paid off. And then they say, what do you expect? Of course, I'm angry. I'm up against it. Well, if you hadn't bought a, a top of the line 
sedan at 22 years old on a seven year loan that includes two other cars that you never paid off, maybe you wouldn't be in this situation. But you know, we consumerism is a choice. And we decided that what from the 19, it, strangely enough, there's a person I quote in this book who I disagree with about everything, and yet I agreed with him about this, Andy Basevich. Basevich is this relentless critic of modern American consumerism, but Andy was absolutely right that after 1990, in the end of the Cold War, we said, uh, okay, everything's done. Where's the Lexus in my driveway? That's my, you know, I'm entitled to this. Um, and the notion that you would live with less living space or drive a car longer or, um, you know, make it go to a state university. These are all things that Americans say clearly democracy has failed. Yeah. I, so there is a, I'm going to put it in the chat, um, but you should watch this after the show um, and people should watch after the show. It's a wonderful um, Louis C.K. I know he's canceled, but I'm yes. back. I know the um, clip they're going to use. But this is, and it's like, it's this, and everything you're saying resonates with me. And this clip is so good. He was on Conan and he's talking, he's like, I'm in flying in the miracle flight on this airplane from New York to LA. And I'm in, I'm like flying this like incredible miracle miracle of, of like air travel 10,000 feet above above the earth's surface um and we have wi-fi on this flight everything and the guy next to me's internet goes out and he just slams his computer shut and throws a fit and like hits the like the stewardess button is like like how like my, what, what what shit is this i can't like even get on to and he's like everything is amazing and, and everybody's crazy. unhappy. And everyone's unhappy. And so what I take from that, I, I do think, so this is like, this is like, this is Louis C.K.'s like thing. It's like, everything is amazing and everybody's unhappy. And what I take from that, what I take from what you're saying, when you're talking about affluence and communitarianism and like all of these types of things, you have what the unexpected consequences of making people live longer, making people live healthier, making people live better, is that ultimately are the Overton window shifts. And all it's of a sudden called, you lose perspective there's on a basically for it. what real hardship is. There's a term for it. It's called hedonic adaptation. Yep. Uh, where if you've if once you've From slept in a queen size, <laughs> well, you know if once you've slept in a queen size bed for years, you think it is the totally un, impossible to sleep in a twin bed. Yep. If you've eaten sirloin every night, hamburgers taste like leather. Um, and we have now, you know, or a butter couple, chicken. A couple, of, couple of caveats about <laughs> a couple of caveats about this. I, I love leather. I'm very aware that I sound and I say this in the book. This sounds like Harold Macmillan in 1957 saying our people have never had it so good because it's true that in any given point in history, you're probably better off than in a previous point in history. The problem is that even within our lifetime, we have escalated this geometrically. Yes. To the point, you know, like when people say, well, you know, you know, almost. there was time, there was a time when I'm like, wait a minute, that's when I was 30. Don't tell me about that time. I was an adult. I was a married adult at that point. Um, the the other thing uh, that I, you know, th none of this means that there are really serious problems that democracies face all the time. I mean, but th the comparison, and let me just throw a couple of statistics out there, for example, um, flying. In 1979, before the deregulation of the airlines, only 15% of Americans had ever flown commercial in any, either domestically or internationally. Like, people complain about the expense and the inconvenience and, you know, how can it be like this? And, it, well, there was a simple well, answer people, to this. People, for, people forget this, but you used to get dressed up. Well, because only 15% of American adults had ever flown, ever in their lives. Um, you know, yes, college is very expensive. You know why? Because everyone goes to college. That's one of the many reasons why, when I, start, when I was in college my first year in 1979, 1980, only 14% of American women had a college degree. It's like, well, okay, how will my daughter afford college? Well, in 1980, the way she afforded college was she can go. Like, it's a problem. It's a first world problem to say, how will I manage the fact that four of my kids are going to go to college? That was, 
you know, you watch an old movie like It's a Wonderful Life where, you know, he, George Bailey said, well, he gave his college money to his brother so he could go. Yeah, because there's like a thousand people, fucking people dollars. People can't even process that thought now. Uh, you know, and and so this, what where I drew the line is not to say everything's great and you should be happy and, you know, know your place, you serfs, um, but rather to say, stop blaming democracy for things you don't have and that you want. Because democracy is a, is something about, democracy is about something else. It's about tolerance, secularism, universal rights. It's not about, it's not a wish machine. And what, what's, what people have done that, that led me to write this book, which I'll hold up again, um, is how many people, again, in Britain, in Italy, in the United States said, well, I am, you know, my life is not what I think it should be. And therefore democracy as a system of government sucks. And that to me is just, that's, to me, that's obscene. We are going to leave it there because we are over time. No, uh, we're because we're going to leave no, it with obscenity. But we should you should come back and like actually talk about the book for uh, by which time uh, we will have actually read, read it. It, it drops um, on yeah. Thursday. It, uh, it, yeah, so, worst day is Thursday. So uh, uh, next Thursday, come back and let's let's discuss it. Uh, we will be back tomorrow. Kate, tell us about our guest tomorrow. Yeah, we have Laura Laura Edelson, who is the the primary um, principal investigator and researcher at NYU that was banned from Facebook for um, uh, whose accounts are banned from Facebook for running the Ad Observer um, uh, plugin and collecting data that uh, Facebook said was going to be in violation of the consent decree from the FTC. And so she's going to be coming on to talk about a New York Times op-ed and uh, everything that's been happening since then. Uh, and that will be. 22 hours and 54 minutes from now. And until then, Tom Nichols, you're a great American. And Kate? And an accomplished liar. And I cannot a, believe that, actually. Super you accomplished totally, liar. Totally you, had me. you nailed it. Yeah. Um, and Kate? <laughs> uh, we don't and have yes, fun people, anymore. I was telling the truth. Yes, I my, know. My story was totally true. We don't have fun anymore, but we can give high fives. Even to Bob Dole. <laughs> we will see you tomorrow. See you tomorrow.